Welcome to Hebrew Readers Church. I'm your brother, Zach Wild, and this is your brother, Kasafo. Uh, this lesson is going to be a continuation from the last lesson, Who is God? And now we're actually going into the religion of God so that everyone can understand that each one of these idols has a doctrine that comes with them. And when people serve these idols, they have to keep the doctrine of the idol. All right, Kasa, can we start at Jeremiah chapter 10? Verse 10 and 11, please. Yeah, sure. Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 10. But Ahaya is the true Alahayim. He is the living Alahayim and an everlasting king. At his wrath, the earth shall tremble and the nations shall not be able to abide his indignation. You notice how I said Ahaya is the true Alahayim. Because there's other Elohim, but he's the true, the one that created the heaven and the earth, all right? He's the living Elohim, the everlasting king, all right? Continue, Casa. Verse 11. Thus shall ye say unto them, the Elohims that have not made the heavens and the earth, even they shall perish from the earth and from under these heavens. All right. So these are the idols that we're referring to that did not make the heaven and the earth. And these idols are the ones that come with their own doctrine, contrary to the doctrine of Ahaya and the true living Elohim that created the heaven and the earth. All right, All right we're gonna jump into Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 14 through 30. I, I'm gonna stop you in the midst of it, Casa. So uh, it's okay. gonna be chapter 14, verse 12, and then we're gonna skip over to verse 22. Okay. Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 14, verse 12. For the devising of idols was the beginning of spiritual fornication and the invention of them, the corruption of life. Right. So the reason why the devising of idols was the beginning of spiritual fornication is because it was contrary to Elohim. That means that what they were teaching was not the same as what Ahaya and Yache, our Dono, our Lord and Savior, and what the Holy Spirit was actually teaching. So it became spiritual fornication. That means that you would pretty much have fornication is you, you're cheating. So you're not with your original maker. You're not with the one who actually created you or the one that you're supposed to be married with. You're actually going off to another. So this is why it, it became spiritual fornication. All right. And it also became the corruption of life because it took you off of the path that was leading you the right way, right? So every doctrine of an idol is, is not going to be sound doctrine. It's not going to be good for you. It's going to take you off the path, okay? You can continue, Brother Kasim. All right. Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 14, verse 22. Moreover, this was not enough for them that they erred in the knowledge of Allah Hayyam, but whereas they lived in great war of ignorance, those so great plagues called they peace. Right. Now, this is, this is very um, similar to what's going on even today. It's the same thing, right? Now, they erred in the knowledge of Allah because they went off. They went into a path of following idols and doing the doctrine or following the doctrine of those idols, right? And then they lived in great war of ignorance. So that means that they were doing things, not really understanding why they were doing it. It's a great war. It's a battle, whether in the mind or outside of them. So that war started taking place within people. All right. Those so great plagues called a peace. So all these bad things be happening to you or calamities, stuff that happened that isn't good. And you call it peace. We call it peace. We got so used to it. We're so accustomed to bad things happening to us and not understanding why they're happening to us. We don't understand it's because we're off of the path and we're doing things that is not of the doctrine of the Elohim that we're truly trying to serve, but we're actually following the doctrine of these idols that is making us be used to such chaos, be used to such calamities coming upon us and we call it peace we just say oh that just so happened to happen not understanding that it was following the idol and following his doctrine and sinning 
that allowed those things to come upon us that caused us to have those calamities or to have those plagues come upon us. But yet we're saying, hey, it's peace. It's peace. It's going to pass. It just so happened. It was by chance. But as you get, as you further in the knowledge of Elohim, as you further in understanding the spiritual things, nothing happens by chance. Everything happens for a reason. Everything happens for a purpose, whether it be to teach you, whether it be to, for you to learn a lesson, whether it be to grow you, whether it be for something that you have done and it's coming back upon you. Elohim is the judge. So when he judges you and that, plague or whatever comes upon you it's from him for what purpose he's deemed it to be for for your edification and for your growth um continue brother casa verse 23 for whilst they slew their children in sacrifices or used secret ceremonies or made revelings of strange rites they kept neither lives nor marriages any longer undefiled. So you see all the things that the people were doing to their idols. They were actually keeping the commandments. They were keeping the doctrines of their idols. So you can see the sacrifice in the children, the certain idols that you follow that require that. Secret ceremonies, the certain idols that you follow that require those. Reveling of strange rites. Now, we know those things specifically go into really worshiping the devil because that's a far one, right? That's very far out there. So that's literally the devil's doctrine. But as it keeps on going, it says, they neither kept lives nor marriages any longer undefiled. So you see it's getting lighter, but you can see that these are different idols that are being worshiped and that their doctrine is being kept. If you can continue, Brother Kassel. But either one slew another traitorously or grieved him by adultery, mm -hmm. so that there reigned in all men, without exception, blood, manslaughter, theft, and dissimulation, corruption, unfaithfulness, tumults, perjury, disquieting of good men, forgetfulness of good turns, defiling of souls, changing of kind, disorder in marriages, adultery, and shameless uncleanness. All right. So these are just a wide range of different doctrines that come with different idols. So you can see how far it goes, depending on what idols you're serving or what idol you're serving, because you can be serving multiple idols or you can be serving one, as we see in different cultures. You see that there's different, the different alahayams that they serve in their religion, from the Buddhist religion to the Indians, Hindus religion to whatever religion that you want to correlate it to. There's so many idols that they serve, and each idol comes with a doctrine. Each idol comes with certain things that you have to do for that idol. All right. Verse 27. For the worshiping of idols not to be named is the beginning, the cause, and the end of all evil. Right. That verse, the worshiping of idols is the beginning, cause, and end of all evil, shows that it's from worshiping idols and performing the works of their doctrine, all evil is transpiring in the world. Mm -hmm. In support of understanding that idols have doctrines. And not to be named, because we're actually not supposed to say their names according to the law in the first place. So you can see how Solomon was actually trying to keep us on track with keeping the commandments and also giving us insight and understanding of what was going on by us not keeping the law of Elohim and walking in his ways. And now it goes on to explain what happens when worshiping idols and serving them verse 28 for either they are mad when they be merry or prophesy lies or live unjustly or else lightly forswear themselves 
So these are the things that come upon people when they actually start worshiping those idols. There's certain things that there's certain mannerisms and there's certain things that they do in their day to day life that actually show you the Alahayims or the idols in which they're serving. Right. It says for either they are mad when they be merry. So they're up and down. They don't know, like one moment they're happy, one moment they're sad, one moment they're happy, one moment they're sad. They can't, there's no, there's no contentment. There's no, they're not level. Or prophesy lies. So they'll, they'll speak a lot of lies. They'll lie a lot, right? Or live unjustly. Or else lightly forswear, forswear themselves. So they'll say they promised something or and then they know that they're not going to keep it. Or they say they're going to do something knowing that they're not going to do it. All right, Brother Kass. Verse 29, for in so much as their trust is in idols, which have no life, though they swear falsely, yet they look not to be hurt. Right. So because they serve in that idol, and the idol allows them according to their doctrine that they can lightly forswear themselves or that they can swear falsely or they can lie. They don't look to be hurt. They don't look for any judgment to come upon them because they're actually keeping the doctrine of their idol. So by them saying, hey, I'm doing what's right by my idol, why would harm come upon me? when we know that we're not supposed to lie, we're not supposed to bear false witness according to the law of Ahaya, the law of Alahayim, the true Alahayim. But you can see the mindset of worshiping idols. You can see the mindset that they can do wrong and nothing bad will come upon them because that's what they believe. And we, we talked on belief in, in the other lessons. Um, especially the series that we just did, if anybody was able to catch it. But we actually have to be on the right side of things. We actually have to be really keeping the doctrine and keeping the understanding of Elohim so that we do not be taken away from the good things and cleaving unto the bad things that are going to take our life away from us. Brother Kassifo? How be it, for both causes shall they be justly punished. Both because they thought not well of Allah Hayyim, giving heed unto idols, and also unjustly swore in deceit, despising holiness. So even if they believe that the idol is right, and that by following what the idol doctrine is, that they're going to get whatever reward by it, they're still going to be ju judged according to Ahaya's law and according to Alahayim, the true Alahayim's law. So take heed. Take heed not to follow the doctrine of the idols and to cleave unto it, but to cleave unto the doctrine of Alahayim, knowing what's to come to all those that are actually performing and keeping that doctrine of idols. Okay? Idols have a doctrine. And those that worship them walk in the doctrine of the idols they serve. So whatever idol you're serving, you're going to walk in that doctrine. Whatever idol you're calling upon, you're going to walk in that doctrine because that spirit of that idol is actually coming upon you because you're actually provoking that spirit by calling upon it and worshiping it. By invoking. Okay, you call right. upon his name, you're praying unto it. All these things actually strengthen these spirits, just like praying unto Allah and worshiping him strengthens us in his spirit. All right. And we're going to go into the Acts of Thomas, chapter 76, and it's going to explain that into further detail. Acts of Thomas 76. And the devil said, this is the devil speaking to Thomas. And the devil said, I ask of you, give me permission to leave or I'll go to the places where you want me to be. And I'll take all of your instructions. I will not listen or fear my ruler that has the authority over me. Which is the devil that had authority over that devil, right? They call it devil or evil spirit. 
so the actual true devil is the one that has authority over him or satan or whatever you want to call him he had different names like you that have come to preach the good news so have i also come but to destroy right so hold up he said just like you that have come to preach the good news so thomas was actually preaching the doctrine of his alahim and this evil spirit said i've also come to preach the doctrine of my alahim but mine is to destroy right you see the intention of the evil spirit the doctrine is to destroy so when you're cleaving and you're conjuring and you're speaking and invoking these idols, they're actually coming to ruin your life. They're not actually coming to help. Go ahead, Brother Costa. And like you, if you don't fulfill the will of him that sent you, he will bring punishment upon your head. So it is with me also. If I don't do the will of him that sent me before my appointed season and time, he shall send me to my own nature. Right. So just like we're supposed to be uh, apostles or disciples, speaking the word of Allah Hayim, as far as the men, speaking the word of Allah Hayim and, and being a testimony or being an example on the earth, these evil spirits actually have to do the same thing. And by them doing that unto you, you become an apostle or a disciple to that evil spirit or to Satan because you start actually showing through your works and through the way your manner of life that your manner of life is right and you are teaching other people to operate in that same manner of life so you become a spokesperson for the evil spirit just as um, Eve or the serpent the serpent became a spokesperson for the devil, right? So the serpent became an evil spirit. And then the evil spirit went and spoke to Eve and Eve became an apostle or a disciple of the serpent, the evil spirit and the devil. So this is what we're actually, we're actually invoking when we're actually serving these idols. It's we're becoming a, a what's the word um a Messenger, staple a vessel right? we're becoming a vessel and a staple of unrighteousness and we're teaching other men and women to operate in the same unrighteousness that we're preaching or promoting so this is why we actually have to cleave unto the right spirit and actually do what's right so that we can be a vessel for honor and not dishonor you know where we are, Brother Casa? I do. All right. And uh, like your Christ that helps you in whatever you do, so is my Father that helps me in whatever I do. Mm. And in the same way, he uses you to prepare a vessels worthy of inhabitant. So also does he seek out a vessel whereby I may accomplish his deeds. Right, so we're all being used. That's why he said, you wanna be a vessel unto honor or a vessel unto dishonor? Because we're all vessels and we're all being used for a purpose, whether it be for good or whether it be for bad. Now, are we gonna allow our habitation to be for a righteous angel to come into us and to help people within the earth to grow? and go in the right direction? Or are we going to let our habitation be for evil spirits that's going to help people be destroyed? It's very simple. It's one or the other. It's not hard. It's just a choice. It's a choice to what you're going to choose and what you're going to stand by, knowing what's operating and actually having the knowledge to know what you're calling upon and actually understanding who you're calling upon to know what spirit you're going to invoke to help you. Because he said that just like the spirit comes of our father comes to help us, 
the spirit of his father comes to help him. So what, what spirit are you invoking to help you? All right. All right. All right. Go ahead, Brother Casa. In the same way he nourishes and provides for his subjects, so also does he prepare chastisements, punishment, and torments for them that become my dwelling place. All right. So you see why all those bad calamities come upon you, why those plagues come upon you. Right. It's because it's because of that dwelling place that you're becoming. You're becoming a, a dwelling place for demons, for evil spirits. And according to the apocalypse of Paul, when he went into the firmament, where all the evil spirits dwell or the, or the demons dwell, they are chaotic. There's no peace amongst them because they don't know peace. Peace is of the holy angels, of the holy virgins. It's of the, the doctrine of Elohim. So they can't operate in the same way as Elohim. They have to operate in the opposite. So if you have a dwelling place or a habitation for evil spirits, there's not going to be any peace amongst you. Everything's going to be chaotic. There's always going to be something going on. Right. Drama, as they would say. All right. Go ahead, Continue. brother. Pastor. Yes, please. And in the same way, he rewards you for your works by giving you eternal life. So in the same way, he rewards my works by giving me eternal destruction. Anybody that follows after the idol is going to reap the same thing. Go ahead. And like you that are refreshed by your prayers, and good works, and spiritual thanksgivings, so am I also refreshed by doing murders adulteries and doing sacrifices made with wine upon altars so you can see the things you can see the contrariness of both things you see the good side and the evil spirits they know they know the good things from the bad they're very intellectual they know what's good and they know what's bad and they chosen what was bad and their fate is set. Whereas we still have that choice. And that's why they try to um, manipulate us. They have to manipulate us to thinking that, hey, this is normal. Hey, these bad things are normal. This is the environment that I was raised in. It's normal. These are the things that I'm used to doing. Having plagues and things come upon me is normal. I'm used to that. I don't want to change. When we, when we have the cognitive ability to say, okay, something's not right here. Okay, let me look and see if there's something better. He said, just as we're refreshed by our prayers, good works, and spiritual thanksgivings. He's very aware of the things that refresh us, that actually make us whole and make us at peace. He says, so am I also refreshed by doing murders, adulteries, and doing sacrifices made with wine upon altars. All those things are, are, are against how Elohim tells us to operate. The true Elohim, Ahaya, tells us to operate in Yahche and the Holy Spirit. All right. You ready, Brother Kasa? Yes, I am. It goes on to say, and like you, as you convert men to eternal life, so do I also pervert men that obey me to eternal destruction and torment. Mm -hmm. So you receive your own and I receive mine. All right. Now, this is the choice that we have to make. Do we want to be the one that helps convert people into eternal life by allowing the good 
spirits to operate in us and calling on the true Elohims and calling on the ones that are going to actually help save us? Or are we going to help pervert men to obey to eternal destruction? All right, let's carry on. Uh, can you read Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14 for me, Brother Costa, please? Yes. Ephesians 4 and 14. That we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men, and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Now, hold on. We just went through a whole chapter about how the evil spirit is using us to pretty much deceive people to go into eternal destruction, right? Now it's talking about by the slight of men. So now we're actually seeing the results of the people that it's being used by the evil spirits, right? It says that henceforth we be no more children. I mean that we be, we be established, we understand, we don't operate in ignorance any longer and carried about with every wind of doctrine. That means that we actually understand good from evil. We actually understand the things that are of Allah and the good things. And we also understand the things that are evil that the evil spirits are trying to do within us or where they're trying to carry us, right? By the slight of men. So these are the ones that are operating in the evil spirits that are being an example of an unbeliever and also cunning craftiness which means that they've gotten very good at what they're doing. They've actually been operating in those evil spirits for so long that they become experienced. Now, even in the example I spoke of with Eve earlier, you've seen the craftiness of Eve when it came to her dealing with Adam. No, I'll protect you from Allah Hayyam. The craftiness that comes with those evil spirits when they're operating in you. Just to get someone else to fall, just to get someone else to go and allow that evil spirit to have a place in them as well. And we have to be very, very mindful of that, of what spirit we're actually operating in so that we're not the one that's causing somebody else to go off into iniquity to go off into sin whereby they lie and wait to deceive so they're waiting that spirit that doctrine that they're operating in that they're believing is actually waiting to catch you waiting to when you're not paying attention or to catch you unaware or catch a person that's not really of understanding someone that's ignorant so that they can say, okay, I got you. Yeah, I see you're weak. Let me get you. We have to understand the goodness and the good things of Allah so that we're not led astray by the evil spirits that are operating in general and also the evil spirits that are operating in other people that are trying to cause us to stumble. Now, for an example, a, a biblical example, right? Even the scribes followed the doctrine of idols that they were worshiping. Um, Brother Casa, can you jump over to um, Mark chapter 12, verse 38 through 40, please? Yeah, sure. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Mark chapter 12, verse 38 to 40. And he said unto them in his doctrine, beware of the scribes which love to go in long clothing and love salutations in the marketplaces and the chief seats in the synagogues and the uppermost rooms at feasts, which devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. These shall receive greater damnation. Right. So the thing for the scribes, they loved vanity. They loved clout. They loved everything that came with it. What's the word you use, Brother Casa? Uh, 
Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think clout was the word. You, are, I think, I think it said van. It was a vanity. It was vain glory. Vain glory. Vain glory. That's there it. The vain glory. They love the vain glory. The <laughs> I did. <laughs> <laughs> they love the vainglory. They love what came with being of a person of high stature. And they will put on the show to gain that glory. And that was their damnation. Because the idol that they were serving, that was the doctrine of their idol. And that's what led them astray. And that's what they kept. And it actually led them to greater damnation because they actually continue to serve the idol and they never turn from it. All right now, seeing that we're talking about the idol God, right? Let's see what his doctrine is. Let's jump into Isaiah 65 and 11. We're going to touch on the scripture where his name is, and then we're going to go into his name, and then we're going to actually go into his doctrine, right? Isaiah 65 and 11. But ye are they that forsake Ahaya, that forget my holy mountain, that prepare a table for that troop, and that furnish the drink offering unto that number. All right. Now, the word troop, it said that they prepared. If you watched the lesson on who is God, we actually went into the word troop, but now we're going to touch on it very briefly. Um, it says that they forsook Ahaya forgot his holy mountain and they prepared a table for that troop so they actually prepared a sacrifice or offering uh the word troop uh can we go on to h1408 this is the origin god a variation of 1409 fortune a babylonian deity now in h1409 the word god right i'm gonna let Casa break this down in a moment. The word in Hebrew is a G and a D. Okay. And it's pronounced God. G-A-W-D. God. I'm going to let Casa go into the, the etymology of the, of the word itself. Um, but what I did want to touch on is that it's fortune or Babylonian deity. And in H1409, it says, in the sense of distributing fortune. Okay? So, it's a Babylonian deity of fortune, right? In the sense of distributing. Now, the religions of the world that actually call upon this idol, right? God. If you haven't noticed that there's a correlation amongst all of them. And the correlation is, it has to do with money. It has to do with prosperity. It has to do with your blessing to be accounted for by how much money you have. How well you're blessed or how much you're blessed goes into how much money you have. Because this deity is very specific with fortune or money. Okay? So a lot of people, when they're very, very driven by money, you will notice that they call on God because it goes together. Unlike other civilizations, like let's say like ancient Chinese, they didn't call on God. They had their other, they had their other deities and the money wasn't a big impact of their religion. When you think of the monks, they didn't care about money. But yet they called on all their idols. But God wasn't a part of their idols. They had other idols. They had other deities. And they were following the doctrines of all their other deities. So you can see how the influence of those deities actually impacts us. Casa, do you want to go into the etymology of the word? I can touch on real quick if you need me to. <clears throat> sure. So the Hebrew, we see GD, 
if I'm not mistaken, from looking into the true ancient Hebrew language, the word for that is gudo. I don't have my notes in front of me to go into the root words. Then you have, for one, Chaldean, Canaanite, and Hebrew are different languages according to the scriptures. So among the Hebrews, you have gudo. Then among the Chaldeans, they have Gad. And then we see in the concordance in H1409, where from among the Canaanites, God. And that helps us know that the Hebrews began worshiping God because God was the Canaanite deity. He wasn't a Hebrew deity. So God was literally who they worship. And as you move on in time, among the Germanics, this is from a book called The Scriptures, copyright 2000 by the Institute of Scriptures Research. Its explanation for the word God, it says, apart from Gad, the son of Jacob, there was another Gad. The astrologers of Babel called Jupiter by the name of Gad. Touching on, we just read in concordance, Gad is the Babylonian deity. So the astrologers of Babel called Jupiter, which is the Roman deity, they called him by the name Gad. He was also well known among the Canaanites, where his name was often coupled with Baal, as Baal God, which according to the Masoretic vowel pointing in the book of Joshua is pronounced Baal God. This same name is discovered in ancient Germanic languages as Gat, Gada, God, God, Gud, Gade. And if you're familiar with English, English has Germanic roots for the etymology of the word God today in English, it stems from the Germanic languages. The Germanic languages, it speaks in the Encyclopedia of America of the 1945 edition, has the definition for the topic God as God, common Teutonic word for personal object of religious worship formerly applicable to superhuman beings of heathen myth. So God was a word the Gentiles used to worship their heathen idols. On conversion of Teutonic races to Christianity, term applied as to supreme being. So when the Gentiles were converted, they took the names of their idols and started using their idol's name for the deity of the Christians. This is how we transition today where in, in English, the word is being used commonly, but in truth, it's the name of an idol from the Teutonic people, which are Germanic people, the Canaanites and the Babylonians, as we discuss in scripture on the lesson, who is God? So hopefully that helps with the etymology of it, All right? So pretty much they took the pronunciation from the, the what the, the Canaanites. Canaanites? The Canaanites. Pronunciation from the Canaanites and wrote it in English as the pronunciation. Right. <laughs> All right. I hope that helped everybody. Um, let's jump over to Matthew 6 and 24 so that we can understand what Yache was actually talking about when he was trying to edify us on truly walking correctly. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. He cannot serve Allah and Mammon. Now, this is where it gets very interesting. Okay. It says, No man can serve two masters. Now, there's no way that money is a master. Money can't be a master because the scripture says the love of money is what actually destroys us, right? It's the love of money. It's not money itself. But when Yahweh spoke in this verse, he said, you can't serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. 
You cannot serve Alahayim and God. <laughs> the, the, the definition for mammon in G3126, it, it says mammon of Chaldean origin, confidence that is figuratively wealth personified. Mammonus, that is avarice deified. Because God is the Alahim of Mammon. You can't serve them both. You can't serve Alahim and God. <laughs> wow. It was known. Can we jump over to uh, Matthew 19 and 23 and 24, please? Sure. Matthew 19, verse 23. Then said Yachi unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again, I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of Allah. All right. So a man that trusts in his riches or a man that follows after God, because if he trusts in his riches, then he's worshiping the idol, the idol God. It's hard for a man to do that and to enter into the kingdom. No matter what else he has going on, if that Allah has a place in him, he's not going to make it. So we have to put aside that deity. We have to put aside that idol and actually operate and follow Allah because we know that if we follow Allah all things shall be added unto us. We're not gonna trust in riches. We're not gonna trust in those idols because we're gonna be fully trusting on Allah and he's gonna be leading us and preparing us to have those things where they won't affect us or they won't lead us astray. Now we know that God has his doctrine, which is strongly surrounded by money, right? Now, even looking at modern day today, where in certain of the churches, tithing is such a, a big thing where people are gaining that clout or they're gaining that recognition by how much money they're actually given to the church. And it's no different, it's no different than that of old times, even in, in Acts, was it chapter 8, verse 14, uh, with Simon, who actually wanted to buy the Holy Spirit. Um, Kasa, can we touch on that real quick on uh, Acts chapter 8, verse 14? And I think we're going to read down to, what is it, uh, 18, if I'm not mistaken? 19. 19? Okay. Sure. Acts chapter 8, verse 14. Now, when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of Allah, they sent unto them Peter and John, who, when they were come down, prayed for them, that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet she was fallen upon none of them. Only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Yahweh. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that at whomsoever I lay hands, he may also receive the Holy Spirit. So you see, even Simon at that time, Simon was worshiping multiple idols, but you can also see that he was worshiping God at the same, because he trusted in that money, and he understood the power of that money, not understanding the power of Allah and seeing how he was rebuked for the act or the way that he was operating from the apostles, seeing that they were operating in the spirit of Allah which had no agreement with money. So you can see the dichotomy and even in today's churches where it's not the spirit of Allah that they're looking for, they're looking for the money 
Yeah. Can we jump into First Timothy chapter six, verse seventeen through nineteen? And these are the things that Elohim is actually exhorting us on, so that when we are prepared and ready for His blessings to come upon us, that we will be prepared. First Timothy chapter six, verse seventeen: Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living Allah who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. That they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate. So you can see how Allah if he's preparing you to be rich in this world, he's going to prepare you to be selfless as well. Because he's giving you the riches so that you can help other people, so that you can be an example of a believer in the earth. Because he's giving you a treasure for a purpose. He didn't just give it to you for you to, to keep it and hold it in your storehouse, or to hold it in your bank, or to hold it in your house, in your, in your safe. He gave it to you for a purpose to actually help other people. It's amazing, if I may, that Abraham was known for his wealth. Jacob had wealth, but they all went through trials before. Remember, Abraham spent his youth in a cave, and he was tried by the fire of the king of Babylon before he was given all the riches that the Chaldeans gave him, as seeing how Allah prepares a person. Jacob he went traveling with nothing but his staff, empty-handed, was in servitude to his father-in-law who oppressed him all that time before he finally got to leave with his family and the wealth that Allah gave him after working hard and learning through experience to see, understanding how those who Allah wants to give wealth, he actually prepares them beforehand like you were talking about. Right. You have to make sure that you understand what he's giving you so that you don't take it for granted or you don't get lifted up within yourself because it, it literally said that they be not high-minded. Oh, yeah. That you don't get to trusting in those uncertain riches, but your trust is in Allah who gave things richly to enjoy. Right. Praise him. Continue to First Timothy 6 and 19. Laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. Right. So those riches that Allah gives you. First, he said, make sure that they be rich in good works. So you actually have to understand that you actually have to keep the law and operate in the fruits of the spirit so that you can understand what to do with the actual wealth that Allah has given unto you for the help and the betterment of, of other people. Not laying up in store against the time to come. So you're trusting in that money. Like I'm gonna keep this money for what may happen in the future. But instead focus on what Allah wants you to do. that he may lay hold on eternal life. It's a great responsibility to have wealth because the more you're given, the more you're responsible for. And Allah understands that. That's why the devil will go and give people wealth knowing that they're not ready for it and it'll destroy them. But Allah makes sure that that person is ready but when he's ready to give them wealth because it comes with a great responsibility. Um, can we jump into 1 Timothy 6 and 9 and, and 10, please? Sure. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 9. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, 
was drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Now the part I want to really touch on, it says, for the love of money is the root of all evil. It says, which while some coveted after. So instead of actually coveting after the things of Allah and actually wanting to do what's right in the sight of Allah you coveted after money and you chase that because you're worshiping, you're, you're following that idol, you're calling upon that idol God, you're following him, you're coveting after the money, you're coveting after what he can give you. Not understanding that you're erring from the faith because you're not actually following Allah Hayyam. You're not following Ahaya. You're not following Yahweh Christ. But you're following after an idol. You're following after God. And you're pissing yourself through with many sorrows because of all the things you're going through all the plagues you're going through, everything that you have to go through from following that idol. You're going through all these sorrows. You're unhappy. You're depressed. You're, you're in sorrow. You're sad. But yet, you're continuing to persevere for the sake of money. You continue to persevere for the sake of that idol. Can we jump over to Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 through 21? And let's understand what Allah has to exhort us on when it comes to what we're actually supposed to be striving for. <clears throat> sure. Matthew 6 and 19. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. If you trust in riches, that's where your heart's going to be. God's going to have dominion over you. But if you trust in Allah and you trust in his riches, that's where your heart's going to be. Right. Now, we've all made mistakes and we've all served idols in this world. Don't get me wrong. We've all done it. But let us not continue and instead be examples of believers in the true Allah who created the heaven and earth. Can we jump over to 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12, and we're going to read all the way down to 16, please. 1 Timothy 4, verse 12. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine, continue in them. For in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Hopefully this inspires you guys to actually learn the doctrine if you don't know it. Um, and definitely continue striving forward and actually making the choice to actually serve in the true Allah and putting away all the idols and their doctrines. I strongly concur for you guys to learn the doctrine. Um, Casa, what should be the first place to go for them to actually start learning the doctrine? I'm sure we have plenty of playlists. 
the playlist called for newborn babes. Newborn babes. It's a oh, nice nice starting place. And uh, if Alahai and Will's it, we'll link it to the end of this video so that you guys can just click on the link and uh, it'll be either over here or over there. And you can just click on it, take you straight to newborn babes and you can start learning the doctrine. All right. So we hope everybody enjoyed the lesson. You got anything before we leave, Brother Cosmo? No, that was great. Praise Ahai. It was very edifying to understand why the world is all about money and wealth seeing that it's under the hands of idols. Praise all right. him. All right, it's good, man. We hope he keeps you all. We love you all. Thank you guys for joining us at Hebrew Readers Church. And may Allah be with you. Peace.